Hi there and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about John Donne's turbulent relationship with religion. As you can see, I've titled the session John Donne, Religion and Conflict, Part 1. So there will be a part two to this discussion. Um, and the conflict that we're going to discuss is chiefly Dunn's internal conflict and his inner struggle to reconcile his conflicting allegiances. So there's going to be two main parts to this session. We'll begin with lots and lots of crucial context, uh, which will range across the entire course of Dunn's life. Um, and we will end the session with an analysis of his ninth holy sonnet, If Poisonous Minerals. So, Dunn wrote many religious poems in his lifetime. You've probably heard of his holy sonnets, which are also known as the divine sonnets or the divine meditations. Now, a sonnet is traditionally a love poem, and as we'll see in a later video on Dunn's relationship with God, he does sometimes use the holy sonnets as a means of expressing his adoration and love for God in the style of a lover. This is not always the case, however. Sometimes he expresses much more ambivalent feelings towards God, and sometimes he even expresses resentment and disdain. So if you were to read all of the holy sonnets in a sequence, you'll certainly gain a sense of a very conflicted and often contradictory relationship with religion. This conflicted relationship certainly stems in no small part from Dunn's changing allegiances throughout his life. He was born in 1572 to a Roman Catholic family at a time when Catholics were a persecuted minority. As a student, Dunn was a victim of anti-Catholic prejudice. He went to Oxford when he was 11 years old, and after three years of study, he attended Cambridge too and studied for another three years. In order to obtain a degree, however, students had to swear the oath of supremacy. This was a declaration of allegiance to the monarch as the supreme head of the church, and therefore essentially amounted to a denunciation or disavowal of one's Catholicism. Dunn refused to take the oath, and as a result, neither institution granted him a degree at the end of his studies. Um, in addition, Dunn's family suffered as a result of anti-Catholic persecution. Uh, notably, his brother was arrested for offering sanctuary to a Catholic priest, and he later died in prison of a fever. When Dunn finished his education, he enjoyed a leisurely and promiscuous lifestyle. This was in the 1590s, as we discussed last time. In 1601, he married his wife, Anne Moore, which was disapproved of fiercely by her relations. The couple struggled financially for a decade as a result of this disapproval. In the years that followed, Dunn practised the law for some time. And in 1610 and 1611, when Dunn was approaching 40 years old, he published two anti-Catholic polemics. These were a public testimony of Dunn's renunciation of his Catholicism. So this is a really important phase in his changing relationship with Christianity. He's gone from sacrificing his degree by refusing to swear the oath of supremacy to publicly renouncing his Catholicism in print. After this, he was repeatedly asked to take Anglican orders and enter the church. Uh, he refused this in 1607, but after facing continual pressure, he reluctantly entered the ministry in 1615. He rose in the church and in 1621, he was appointed Dean of St Paul's Cathedral. Um, now, I'm aware that I've just bombarded you with contextual information, but the really key takeaway from this is essentially that Dunn began life as a persecuted Roman Catholic from a persecuted Roman Catholic family, but he ended life as the Dean of St Paul's Cathedral. So that's a high-ranking and prestigious member of the Anglican Church. Do bear in mind, however, that Dunn's spiritual journey was never a simple one. His poetry is full of anguish, confusion, conflict and turmoil. He also sometimes refers to Catholic teachings and doctrine in his religious poetry, which perhaps suggests that he continued to feel conflicted in his allegiances, despite his conversion. This conflicted spiritual journey is really strongly apparent in his poems. Many of the holy sonnets are dominated by his seemingly contradictory opinions on religious doctrine and Christian teachings. Today we're going to be focusing on Holy Sonnet 9, If Poisonous Minerals. Uh, in this poem, Dunn addresses the injustice of the Christian doctrine of original sin uh, before reprimanding himself for questioning the wisdom of God. Now, understanding this poem requires something of a mini RE lesson, so please bear with me. The doctrine of original sin is the idea that all human beings are innately sinful creatures. 
In other words, we're born sinful. Uh, the original sin that it refers to is that committed by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and they eat the forbidden fruit. According to the Bible, the whole human race is descended from Adam and Eve, and as a result, we've inherited their sinful nature. As I said, we're innately sinful. Interestingly, the doctrine of original sin is chiefly, though not exclusively, a Catholic doctrine. As Dunn had converted and become a Protestant at this time in his life, this fact is itself, perhaps, evidence of his confused faith and conflicted religious allegiances. Sonnet 9 begins by suggesting that the doctrine of original sin is unjust. The phrase poisonous minerals refers to humanity's corrupted flesh. It suggests that the very atoms which make us up are innately sinful and poisonous. We've been polluted by original sin. Dunn then alludes to the book of Genesis when he writes, that tree whose fruit through death on else immortal us, by which he means that had Adam and Eve not committed the original sin by eating the forbidden fruit, humanity would never have been punished with the curse of death. We would be immortal beings. Notice how Dunn personifies the tree through his use of the verb through. The tree appears to be sentient, and it is actively attacking us. This serves to alleviate blame from humanity. Indeed, humanity appears to have committed no crime at all. It's the tree and its fruit which are performing the act of original sin. They're throwing it at us. Humanity is presented as a helpless victim, which heightens this sense of injustice. Dunn then develops this sense of injustice by pointing out that only creatures capable of rational thought, that's intent or reason, are liable for damnation. This means that sinful animals, such as lecherous goats or serpents envious, will not be damned. If you remember the introductory video to this series, you'll know that we talked about how metaphysical poetry is characterised by intellectual argument, and we can see that here Dunn is listing the reasons why original sin is unfair and unjust in a logical manner. That's not to say that there's not a very emotional sense of spiritual anguish in this poem, though. The rhetorical questions contribute towards this effect. They capture Dunn's confusion, but also his isolation, as his questions can never be, and never are, answered by an external voice. Now, on the ninth line of this poem, we have a volta. Now, if you're not familiar with this term, a volta is a traditional feature of a sonnet. Um, it comes from the Italian word for turn, and it's essentially the turning point in the poem. It might involve a shift in tone or in subject matter. In Dunn's poetry, it usually signals a change in the direction of the argument. So it might be a moment of sudden epiphany, for example, or it might be an entire reversal in what he's arguing for. In Petrarchan sonnets, the volta typically takes place at the beginning of the ninth line. That's between the octave and the sestet. So just to elaborate on this in a little more detail, a traditional Petrarchan sonnet is 14 lines long, and we refer to the first eight lines of this as the octave, and the latter six lines as the sestet. Traditionally, the volta occurs at the beginning of the sestet on the ninth line of the poem. Now, some poets subvert this traditional structure by putting the volta in an unusual position, or not including a volta at all. And if you see that in a poem, you really must consider why they're doing that and what the effect is of doing that. Um, but as you can see here, Dunn is conforming to tradition by having the volta occur at the beginning of the sestet. Now, at the volta, there's a very clear change in tone. Dunn moves from criticising religious teaching to criticising himself for that criticism. He writes, but who am I that dare dispute with thee, O God? He's berating himself for questioning the wisdom of God. Dunn then moves on to beg God to summon a Lathian flood. Now, this is an allusion to the river Lathe from classical mythology, which was said to cause forgetfulness. The souls of the dead drank from the river in order to erase their memories of the lives that they led on earth. Here, Dunn's begging for the mercy of forgetfulness. He writes, I think it mercy if thou wilt forget. He's asking God to forget his sins. So ultimately, this poem is a great one to pick if you're tasked with writing an essay on Dunn's conflicted spirituality, as he begins by undermining a religious teaching before dismissing his concerns and simply begging God for forgiveness. If you're looking for poems to compare this one to, I'd recommend both I'm a Little World and Since She Whom I Loved. 
Now, we'll discuss both of these poems in more detail in the next video, part two of this discussion of the theme of religion. But I will just quickly mention here that I'm a Little World has much in common with If Poisonous Minerals. It too contains allusions to Christian theology, which is chiefly Catholic, and it too begs God for mercy and forgiveness. By contrast, Since She Whom I Loved is a very different poem, and therefore it's great for contrasting with If Poisonous Minerals. It's a poem in which Dunn is plagued by grief and struggles to maintain his faith in God. Uh, as I said, though, we will discuss these next time in part two of John Dunn, Religion and Conflict. For now, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.